Sub to the Point listeners, it's your boy Chris. We have another exciting announcement, and that is the day you've all been waiting for. And that is Rhino X 2025 official announcement. This rolls out to the public for the wait list on October 16th. So next week, be on the lookout on all the social posts because Rhino X waitlist fills up so fast and you do not want to miss 2025 show. We got Goodrich coming back, Geiger, Ken Haynes, a newbie, Kevin Comerford coming back from Service Champions Northern California, Jonathan Bancroft coming in and we're going to change it up. It is going to be another banger of an event. Every time I can, I think I can outdo myself, I do it again. Because this is the greatest show. You've got to do something special in your company to hire employees and to keep employees. And part of it is understanding the positions they're going to be working for and what they need and what they want. And it's not always about money. It's about security. It's about trust. It's about respect. It's about recognition. It's about being part of something special. Um, And you need to think about all of those in your business. We've been blessed and fortunate to be able to do that. Our success comes from the exceptional people that we have. I mean, exceptional. You put a roof on the way the manufacturer says to put the roof on, you meet the codes and and everything required of the international and local state building codes. The reality is, have you provided a safe working environment where people can advance and people feel wanted? Hey, what's up to the point listeners? It's your boy, Chris, the host of To The Point Home Services Podcast. There is no Chad Peterman today, and he's really missing out because the guy on the other end of the microphone has met Chad Peterman before, and he met him at this fantastic event, the most exclusive home services event, and that was at Rhino X. So I'm excited to have this guest on on today for a a couple of different reasons. One, he's just a great human being, and uh We've, we've got to spend some good time together. And I swear, like every time I'm with this guy, we have the best conversations, super sharp business guy served on a board together, made in some investments together. Um, it's, it's, you know, you, you guys who listen to the podcast, who come to Rhino X, the, per, the the reason people come to Rhino X is because they want to be in the room with the right people who've built some significant business to learn from. You know, rob and duplicate some things along the way that people have already figured out for you. Well, well, this is one of those guys as well. And if you were at Rhino X, hopefully you got to meet uh, Steve Little, who is the president and partner, uh, K-Post Partners. Um, they do roofing, waterproofing, and Tesla solar power and the power walls, a big time Tesla um, uh, contractor down in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. And um, founder and CEO of National Roofing Partners. And more importantly, uh, my friend. So, hey, Steve, welcome to The Point Podcast. I'm excited to share all your brain, your knowledge with all of our listeners. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. You know, I and think about all the, here. The, thr- the thrills that I've had in my life, and, um, and this is ranking right up there with them. So I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm sure this was at the top of your bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, maybe my business bucket list, yeah, but you know, when you've been married 49 years to the bride I have and have four great, great grandkids and, and two great kids, it's hard to beat that bucket list. So, well, listen, it's, it's always exciting to have someone on here. And because, you know, for our listeners, um, even though, you know, he's, been, he's in the roofing, the waterproofing, the solar business, like, like this is going to be an industry agnostic podcast. There's a ton, a ton that you'll be able to learn. I love being able to sit and talk business with Steve. He's so smart. I'm going to stroke your ego for just a second. And, yeah, this and, is going to cost me some money here. I can see that's going to happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, you know, he's really intelligent because he chose Ryan who was his marketing partner. I mean, let's just leave with that. One of the smartest um, moves we made. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, but we met before this, so yeah, we've been, you know we got into a, a couple of invest, or investments together on a board together, and we built a friendship. And um, it's always great when you can talk business at a different level, which you can't always do, depending on where people are at with their businesses. But man, you're always. I've been on lots of board calls with this guy, and he's a sharp one. So I'm like grateful to call him my friend and somebody I can always reach out to. And I'm excited to you know, share a little, again some of just his knowledge and his tenure of having been at, at, you know, at Capos and built this big business. Now these guys, um, it was so cool because we got to build a new website for them and they are, uh, you know, they have an official partnership with the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers. So um, those are great partnerships that you guys have had and you've been able to leverage those in helping, you know, build and, and scale the business along, you know, along the way. Um, but what I, I think I like the most, man, is I think that um, 
one of the best critical thinkers that I've been able to spend time with. And so I appreciate that about you. Like, you know, you've, you really have, I mean, what, how, when did you, when did you even like start at Capos? Like how long ago that, because I know right now you're pushing what, 7980. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Uh, well, first of all, ditto to you too. It's been great to get to know you and um, I've admired you from, from afar and uh, now it's a reality. Uh, we're friends, we're business partners. Um, we, uh, we both are successful because of each other and, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, every chance I get a chance to be with you. Been with K Post Company since November of 2003. Uh, my partner, Keith Post and our CFO, Jane Williams, all went out and started K Post Company. Uh, then uh, it's a typical old story. Get pissed off at where you're at, go across the street, build a business. Uh, my partner had a falling out with his. Um, I was the vice president of business there. Three of us uh, uh, failed in trying to acquire the company. And so we went across the street and started the company. And um, we, uh, being a sports guy, we had a, a, a plan, had a game, a game plan. And we were going to do six, eight, and 10 million bucks the first uh, three years and not have any more than 100 employees and go home at five o'clock every night. And, uh, and we really blew that. <laughs> didn't work out the way you planned. <laughs> you know, the problem is we hired really good people and got the hell out of their way and supported them. And, um, boy, they showed us, we, th we were thinking too small. Didn't, um, didn't think about, uh, becoming the, the contractor, uh, in our market. And, uh, more importantly, uh, what a cool place to work and help people uh, get the compensations they need to grow great families. And so yeah, that's, man, that's what well, we did. One thing I really appreciate you is how much you care about, you know, the people. Um, like genuinely care about the people and, um, you know, and that's, to me, that's shown up because I've gotten to, you know, as I've gotten to know you and actually see you in, in action, it's fun. Um, it is. and, and I want to share just a little bit with our listeners, just to give you some, some context, uh, to where these guys are at today. I'm gonna see if I jack these numbers up or if I get them right. So, um, you know, K post will finish, uh, finish roughly around that we'll call 123 million mark. Um, and by the way, $70 million of backlog. I feel like that's a whole other conversation. It <laughs> is a whole you, other conversation. Backlog. Because if I'm sitting on 70 million backlog, I feel like I'm only focused on backlog. I've got people focused only on clearing backlog. <laughs> okay. We so do. Me, <laughs> we, we do. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so of this 123 uh, million, roughly, we're talking about a hundred million in, in commercial, uh, commercial roofing. Uh, 10 million, in, 10 million as service. And I believe it, you said it was 8 million as waterproofing. Correct. And okay. within that hundred million. Within the hundred million. Right. And then the other 23 being the mixture of residential, uh, residential roofing and solar. And again, I mentioned yeah. Tesla. Um, but Chris, Chris, the, the coolest part of this one location. One single location. single location. So when you look at the, uh, the you know, Roofing Contractor Magazine's top 100 or 150, I guess it's this year, and you start going down the path of those uh, with all the PE acquisitions and things like that that have transpired, we keep dropping from 16th to 17th. I think we're now 22nd or something like that. But all of these people ahead of us have more than one location. Single. One location, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. We are blessed to be in North Texas. It is the greatest economy, the greatest state in the union. It is fantastic. And, uh, and I've been to the facility. It's great. So I've got to see the K-Post compound. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually kind of laid campus. out. Campus, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's actually kind of laid out like, like, uh, like Peter, like Chad Peterman's in the same way where we've got the, we've got the different buildings and the different, like it's on a, it's on a big campus. It's a pretty cool facility. Cool. Yeah, um, very fortunate. But you guys have built a you know a fantastic you know business, and I've gotten to work with Matthew you know quite a bit on the residential side of the business. And um, you know part of part of your you know of our conversation you know in preparation for the podcast was you know wh well how do we achieve this kind of growth? The people who who hear heard me say commercial, I guarantee their brains all went to oh they sold you know it's it's high top line no bottom line like there's no bottom line. Um, totally wrong. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's probably, you probably learned a few things on how to take advantage of that. Right? Oh yeah. And so, so, you know, this business is not just a big business, it's a business business. It's a big business with a very healthy, um, very felt, very healthy business. Well, part of that has to come from your, your, uh, um, selling strategy because you know, what we talked about um, when we were exchanging messages on this is you're selling and not bidding, you know, part of, of your growth strategy. So maybe let's just start with that. What do you mean when you're saying, you know, as part of your sales strategy, you're selling and not bidding? 
So our world uh, in the commercial side um, is very much a bid world. You've got your estimator that also plays salesperson, also plays project manager, also plays delivery of the invoice, goes to all the different meetings, does that stuff, whether it be new construction or remedial. And it's a single source person. All the subcontractors in the construction business or in the, the remedial business uh, have built their businesses this way. We chose a different path. We, we believe that the sales mentality and the personality and the skill set is completely different than the estimating skill set, which is completely different than the project management and the operational side uh, of the business. So we built pods. We have two people to a pod. And inside that pod is a project salesperson and is a services salesperson. And this is on the commercial side. And then we gave them classes of trade so they would own it. So let's say they have uh, industrial uh, as a class of trade. Well, as a person's working for CBRE or JLL or one of those places, they move from place to place to place to place. And our people follow them place to place to place. And we maintain the business at the place we were originally at when that person moved. And so the concept behind that is to give somebody two resources that they can contact with anything having to do with our business. And then to the residential side, the important part of that is about 50% of our business, 40% of our business, excuse me, on the residential side is from our commercial clients. So our, our, our uh, sales team on the commercial side, our pods, are going, if you like what we do for, to your commercial business, you should talk to our residential folks. And then we put our residential salesperson on top of that person and they go and close the deal. Got it. So it's a little teamwork. A little t- tag team. And, you know, you're doing that, you call plays out in the huddle. And sometimes <laughs> you need to bring specialists in for different downs. You know, that's, that's what we do. Got it. Okay. So, so I want to talk about one, one other thing. So, um, and I want to actually just, you know, change gears a little bit. And something that we both, you know, we both implement in our businesses are uh, emotional intelligence. Right. A little bit of a shift here. Um, and this is applicable to every single person listening to this podcast right now, by the way. Um, but training on emotional tel- on the emotional intelligence, I think, is uh, incredibly important. And I think it's very – I think uh, uh, people don't think about it that – like it's not like people aren't thinking about training on emotional intelligence. Call it – there's soft skills training, there's technical training, but like – this is uh, and then listen. Even uh, admittedly, we didn't even implement it at Rhino until you know a few, maybe a, a year ago or so. Um, I guess we've done some cer- different trainings on, it, but we really doubled down on it. And this is after we did the color code. And once we did the color code, we were learning how we can use that because really we're all in the relationship business in some way, shape, or form, right? Like we're a marketing company that, who's trying to sell the business, but we're all in the relationship business. So. You have to know how to talk to people or you have to know how those people receive what you're telling them. So this, the, the color code that we had did helped, you know, helped us. So, so from perspective, you know, like our CSR coaching team can listen to a, a customer like a K post and how their, their call listing or their customer service reps are answering phone calls and can be able to tell are they a red talking to a yellow and then go ahead and then go in and train to it. Say, Hey, when you're talking to someone, here's how you recognize what they are. And then here's how they're going to receive the information. Right. That's that. What does that do? It helps with your booking rate. So Um, we're under an ed, we're under the EOS platform from the book traction. Gina sure. Wickman's book. And we yep. follow the OS to, to the you know, right person, right seat is key. Yep. Do, do, the, uh, do the people get it, want it, and have the capacity to do it? So all of that combined together means it has to happen on the front side. It happens during the recruiting side. So on the recruiting side, we disc all of our uh, salary employee candidates. It just happens. And it typically happens after the first interview. Um, and we use a, a DISC uh, a platform. So where you're doing color codes, we're doing d- the disc side. Um, and the, the reality is, is that if they don't fit the disc for the position that we're looking for, because we've predetermined that after having 21 years experience, um, if they don't follow our, our company uh, core values, um, and if they don't get it, want it to have the capacity to do it, we don't hire them. At the same time, in reverse, every uh, quarter, we're doing a five five five, which is a review of all of our core values and the uh, the guidelines and the disciplines that people have with their particular jobs. And we may have the right person on the, on our team, but they may be in the wrong position. And so we're not afraid to make a change. People want 
when they get into Capos, they want to stay at Capos. We have a very low turnover rate in our uh, salary side of our business. And in our, ironically, in our uh, hourly side of our business, um, we have a very low turnover rate there. It's amazing after 21 years how many 10-year uh, employees that we have in the field. It is friggin' amazing. And so all this has to do with managing the emotional intelligence of your employees. People can make the same money anywhere they go. They really can. Today's unemployment world of under 4% in, in, in unemployment with uh, the hardships we're all having in workforce development, you've got to do something special in your company to hire employees and to keep employees. And part of it is understanding the positions they're going to be working for and what they need and what they want. And it's not always about money. It's about security. It's about trust. It's about respect. It's about recognition. It's about being part of something special. Um, and you need to think about all of those in your business. We've been blessed and fortunate to be able to do that. Our success comes from the exceptional people that we have. I mean, exceptional. You put a roof on the way the manufacturer says to put the roof on. You meet the codes the, and, and everything required of the international and local state building codes. The reality is, have you provided a safe working environment where people can advance and people feel wanted? And we we believe that we've been able to do that at Capos. Yeah. And so you guys, then let me just ask another question around that. Then when you guys run into, I mean, you guys have, you guys have quite a few, uh, quite a few employees. Um, but when you run just into under 500, people, just under 500. Yep. So a couple, that's a whole other business. <laughs> right. It is managing 500 employees. <laughs> um, the, I've had these conversations, you know, with a few of our buddies who, uh, same have, you know, are in the hundreds of employees and they're like, you know what? I wanted to run a hundred million dollar business until I remember there's now 800 people involved. <laughs> but those 800 people, oh my gracious, mm -hmm. what blessings did they bring you when they see it all come together and they execute a plan? Our industry has moved to a subcontractor mindset because it's a less barrier of, of, of entry. They say it's because of workforce development issues, but it's a less barrier to entry to be able to do the business. On the residential side or the B2C side of our business, it, it's mainly a subcontractor business. But on the commercial side, on the B2B side of the business, 90% of what we do are is uh, self-performing work. Yes, we do have some subcontractors. We use them for uh, unoccupied buildings. We use them for demolition. We use them for night work. Um, but that business that we're doing, that $100 million of business that we're doing, Chris, is in the DFW marketplace. We hardly travel. We, we were working on the Houston Rockets arena in, in uh, Houston, obviously, right now, and we're a Dallas-based company, but we were successful in getting the job, not because we were the low-cost provider, but because we put the roof on the American Airlines Center, and we put the roof on Globe Life Field, and put the roof on AT&T Stadium, and so we have the capacity and the track record and the safety to be able to do it someplace else, and, and people are willing to pay a few pennies more to have us go down to, to um, Houston. Now, we try to get our people home at night to sleep with their families because it's all about building a, a homestead, not only at work, but also at home because of work. So we don't travel and we do that kind of, uh, of uh, business. We hopefully that we, we're doing something right. Yeah, I think I, I, I mean, I love that because, you, you know, one, you um, and I have these same conversations quite a bit as well. You're charging for the quality of work that that you do, which also, you know, as the price that you need or the cost that you need to make sure you can do things like that, like make sure that your, you know, employees are getting home. Like do you, they, do you, gives you the opportunity to do the, to go the extra mile and maintain like your guys' great culture. And people find that at the end of the project, we didn't change order them. We did exactly what we said we we're going to do. It's construction. So when things happen, we fix the things that happen because it's freaking construction. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, but they got that experience. Uh, they, you know, we're striving to give them that uh, that Amazon and that Disney experience. It doesn't always happen, but it's how you react when it doesn't happen that makes a difference. That you know, knock on wood, we've got almost 21 years in place coming up here in November, just next month, and um, we got that 70 million in backlog and 400 million in pipeline. I think we're going to be around next year. I think I think the odds are probably pretty good. <laughs> um, so I want to actually just keep going down this path a little bit on like your, your players. So, you know, building a player teams is something that, um, you know, that we decided, you know, we really need to focus on 
getting our hiring dialed in. I, like, look, look, there's good interviewers like that can pull the wool over your eyes. Um, we're all looking for A players, I think. At least I know that I'm looking for A players. Sometimes finding them is, is, is hard, but you do learn as you interview more on how to get to them, you know, and not that you're going to disc them or color code them right out of the gate. Like some contractors do those, do those things, but like, we're not doing that, but you do, you can ask, you know, different clarifying questions to start to figure out who is or isn't, or skill could be something. But when you're creating A player teams, which I know has been another critical piece of your guys's uh, capo success puzzle, how are you, how are you guys finding them? Uh, finding a players or, and, or creating them internally. Cause I'm assuming you're also doing like you're continuously educating and doing these things to create these a players. So, but, but what do you guys do at K post to either find or to build those, uh, build those players internally? Great question. And I have a couple of points for you. Since we had about 300 employees, we've had a recruiter. Recruiter on staff. That recruiter is, is required to not only, um, uh, recruit people, but to retain people. It's a, it's a dual process of what they're doing. So they're constantly, whether it be the field employees or it be salaried employees, they're constantly doing follow-ups. They're constantly putting them in a buddy system. Um, the idea is that you have a tremendous amount of cost when you hire somebody, but you also have a tremendous amount of cost when you lose somebody. Right. And so we're trying to selfishly minimize the, uh, the cost factor on that, but more importantly, build teams. Second of all, we try as hard as we can to promote from within. We try desperately to promote within. And with that point, we try not to hire retreads. We try not to hire people that have been to three, four, five different companies in the marketplace with us. If anything, we will bring people in from out of town, which now requires us to have a few really good recruiters that are in place. The McCormick Partners Group that's, that, that is out there in the commercial side has been a good good uh, partner of ours in the market to um, to help us with that side of the business uh, on, the, uh, on the salary side of the business. Um, and then you just build a culture. I'm telling you that we've built our culture around sports. And candidly, I play head coach for a lack of a title. Sure, I'm president. I'm a, I'm right. a partner. And, but I play head coach and we have offense, defense and special teams on both sides of, of the B2B business on commercial and the B2C business on the on the consumer side. Um, and we have such great position coaches. Uh, when you have a, a I've got a, a, a John Barker is our vice president, of share, senior vice president of shared services. Uh, you've got um, uh Matt uh, Janes, who's our senior vice president in charge of the uh, revenue side and the marketing side of our business. Uh, Jeff Hammond is our senior vice president in charge of the operations side of our business. And then you jump over to B2C to where you have Logan and Daniel and Alonzo and Jim. I mean, th these groups of folks, uh, uh, how can we not be successful when you have these A players? And and are, those, and are they also really good at kind of coaching, you know, coaching your uh I guess coaching up would be, um, you know, those that are on their teams of also trying to get them to, you know, to, you know, to play the, play the ball the same way or to kind of be that, you know, that you know, a player coach. It's a prerequisite in order to, for them to advance in the company. If you cannot coach and you're in a leadership position, we'll find another position for you because of the great skill set you have that you, of what you're already doing for KPOS. But we are looking for coaches. We're not looking for managers. We're looking for leaders we're not looking for managers. These are, there's a huge difference between being a leader and being a manager and even more of a difference of coaching. Yeah, I, I think that actually it didn't, it, maybe it might sound silly to some of these people listening or even to you, but I it actually, I didn't split the two early on when I was in business. I looked at them as the same, definitely not the same. Um, until I learned like early on in business, you know, I wasn't a great manager of people not because I didn't care about people. It's just that I'm more wired to be in a leadership role. Who's out front leading visionary marketing sales, not operations. It's not that I didn't care. It's just, that I didn't, I wasn't, that skill set didn't help me make that person and hold them accountable to be the best that they can be because you know, I have ADHD. <laughs> like I can't, I just couldn't, even, I couldn't even get my own organization, you know, you know, but, but I, my intent is I want the best for them. So I got out of the way. So who ran your business? 
I mean, Anna was the person who ran the business. <laughs> so exactly. You know, like, okay. So the, so we had that same setup at our place. So you were very blessed to have Anna. Not only, first of all, you kicked way outside your coverage for her. Let's just go ahead and put that on the table. Way outside. Just, just like I did with Pam. But the reality is, is that you knew your lane. It's not only know your lane in business, but also learn your, know your lane inside your business. I have a great partner with Keith Post and a great partner with Jane Williams. Um, we knew what our lanes were. And we would always argue behind closed doors. And when we presented ourselves to our employees, we were always on the same page, backing each other up to do it. Now, it wasn't always perfect in the first few years. And as, you, as we've been planning succession for 10 years in our, in our organization. So we've been bringing leaders in and building them and growing them. Uh, we've, we've brought in outside consultants, whether they be, uh, uh, you know, personal coaches to mind performance coaches to industry coaches on specific type of, of uh, work that we're wanting to do, uh, expand our service work, um, expand our processes like with EOS and things like that. Um, but that comes back to knowing your lane, Chris. You, you knew what you were good at. And so you got out of Anna's way and I got out of Keith's way when it came to the roofing side of the business. And But you two collaborated together to grow the business and Keith and I and Jane collaborated to grow the business. Um, you just got to have, a you got to, Check your ego at the door in every aspect of coaching. So as our leaders grow and they start taking over departments, we didn't even have departments the first three years. Everybody did everything. Jane and I had duct tape going across the room, and that was my <laughs> side, and this was her side. Um, to the point now that we have a five acre campuses and nice offices, and yeah. it, it, you got to know your lane. Understand the emotional intelligence of your employees and know your lane. Yeah, that's really good. You said something. I actually want to ask about it. Um, I heard you say mind performance coach. Yeah. What? It, explain what a mind performance coach is. God, I'm, I'm curious I, what, I, what I think it is versus what you're going to say it is. So Chris Flickinger and Associates, uh, Chris, that's going to cost you 20 bucks. But Chris Flickinger and Associates, um, he's out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we, we were turned on to him from a peer group. And we'll talk about peer groups in a second. Um, there were four of us in a peer groups, and one of the guys in the peer group was bringing his son into the business. And his son had worked all through high school and college, et cetera. But he had graduated from college, and it was time now to bring him into the succession side of the business. And, and um, this guy that runs this company runs it from the top down. He is not a modern uh, 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 leader. Um, he's a great leader, but he very much learned the traditional way that everything stops with me. My name's on the door. Do it because I said to do it, that kind of stuff. And his brother, um, who has a, a, another business, was using Chris Flickinger to help him because he had a lot more white-collar employees than he had blue-collar employees. And so um, uh, they hired Chris to help bring – uh, his son into the uh, into the business, and it turned into not only bringing his son into the business, but bringing a, a performance based mindset to uh, the leadership. Uh, and so we brought Chris in, and it was great. I don't know if I answered your question or well, told you what, so, what we did. Yeah. Well, the, no, you still so too high level. Actually, I want to dig one more layer deeper into it. So, what were you what were you trying to solve? with the mind performance coach, you were saying, Hey, cause we wanted to get the, you know, um, what was his name that came into the session plan? The Chris, son? Oh, it was this, it was this particular contractor's son into the business from a leadership standpoint, not from a worker standpoint. So when you're dealing with your company, you want your leadership to think like owners. They want to be paid like owners, right? Mm -hmm. So you want them to think like owners. Yeah. Through the process. And it's a big change from being an employee to being a manager of people to being a leader of a division or a company to being an owner. And what Chris Flickinger helps you do is, first of all, identify the the uh, besides the disc and the colors and things like that, to identify the core of this human being and then identify the core of the team and then challenge the team to work collectively toward the goal of thinking like owners. And it is it totally transformed our business. We went from the mid forties to the high sixty millions, and then COVID hit. Um, and so we had to take a back seat, uh, stabilize the business, stabilize the the uh, uh, the employee base, make a conscious decision to keep everybody employed instead of leveling out the cost. 
Um, and uh, and actually, we stopped all extracurricular uh, costs in the company for a two-year period of time. And then we brought the Chris Flickinger Group back in in um, 2022. And we've gone from dropping back into the 50s to we're going to do 123 million. Yeah. Jeez. Okay. In three years. Yeah, I was going to say because I don't think I don't even think I knew that about about COVID um, and where you're at that time frame because we met just after I think it was yes yeah, supply chain in the to the roofing industry and many subcontractors supply chain just kicked our ass. Well, I did in the, I did across a lot of the trades, um, so we weren't it wasn't just you. Uh, certainly felt it in in HVAC as well with equipment shortages. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of brothers in arms and HVAC and electrical and stuff. And and we're very, all of us are very fortunate that we've rebounded um, and it's been good. But the bringing in a, I think if I was to give anybody advice is don't be afraid of what you don't know because there are people out there that really know it. And I think our youth um, love the GPT chat and they, and they love to be able to pull stuff off the internet and their instantaneous gratif- gratification mindset. That's only going to tell you so much. Getting into the core of what you're made of, what your mind's made of, what you are humanly, uh, your your own core values that you have, your core competencies, this is what the Chris Flickinger Group brought out. And to the point that when it was time to decide the leaders that were going to take Keith and mine's place, they voted on it themselves. Wow. We didn't pick them. They voted on them. Now, we we blew their world up because at that point, Matt Jaynes was our vice president running our service divi- or, or our um, uh, residential division, and he had built that company up from zero to $9 million in, in uh, five years. And so when they picked Jeff and John among the seven of them to be the leaders, we threw a turn in the punch bowl and said, yeah, well, you're going to run it like the three of you instead of the two of you, and Matt Jaynes is going to be the third person. <laughs> And he's great. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, all three of them are doing just, I mean, you can tell by the numbers. You can tell by the retention of employees. You know when you change leadership and some people start to leak out and they start going other places um, and, you know, hey, it's not what I thought it was and things like that. These folks have been able to keep not only the, the leadership that we had, but they've been able to grow the next set of leaders uh, uh, which is part of that recruiting question that you were asking me about. Where do you find people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you have your recruiter who does, who focus on the recruiting and, re- and retention. So that certainly is another layer to your business that is probably helpful with that, I would imagine. We went to the second tier colleges as well in the DFW marketplace. University of Texas at Arlington, uh, uh, University of North Texas, uh, Texas A&M Commerce. These secondary schools, uh, we call them the local campuses, have some great, great employees. And we try to, to pick up a couple each year. Um, one of our people in our HR department um, got her SHRM certification on her first uh, ballot, and she was in our uh, apprenticeship program, in our intern program, all the way to people that are uh, 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 our director of operations came from the uh, University of North Texas as an intern. <laughs> And he's been with us seven years. Okay. That's cool. I mean, that's great. I mean, I know we do some similar things with the local colleges here in Arizona. Um, So it's uh, something that we've done too, pulling in some younger talent, but uh, younger, good talent too. So, um, you know, Chris, one thing on the, on the B2C business, because a lot of your listeners are B2C companies. And that's not a business that we knew at all. Keith and I knew at all. You know, we, we got into the business because when they advertised in the stadium about K-Post Company, uh, the roofing and waterproofing company of the Dallas Cowboys, the phone started ringing. And people were saying, hey, would you do blue and silver shingles? Hey, would you put a star on my house? Hey, would you do this? And so we took the idea to the Cowboys and they said, hell no, we're not going to put shingles on a roof. <laughs> Last thing we need is the hail to hit it. Now it'd be Jerry's problem with the uh, uh, that we put <laughs> shingles that were blue and silver. But what we did see was that there was a consumer play here, and that's how we started the business. We have been so fortunate that I would say 70% of the people that are in our residential business are homegrown, were never in the B2C business. Never. Yeah. Sales side, internal management side, as well as the uh, the support teams. Wow. So, and, and, and you know, one thing I just, I literally just now thought about as you were saying that. Um, there, there's a two part of this one. I for sure thought about other one. I didn't. And that was, um, 
I need to, I need to come. Certainly you guys got to have tickets to this game. Maybe I need, I've not even been to at and I need to go down there and check out a game. What, what game are you talking about? <laughs> Football. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Maybe it may like the, 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 um, uh, Cardinals are coming there to town go. or something. Or right? Is that what, I'm just saying, okay, if there's, is there something there? Yeah. Just maybe consider. Just maybe consider. Let's chat. I might know a person. <laughs> I mean, Cardinals beat the Cowboys last year. Was, uh, yeah, and, and they they give us a pretty good game each time. You know, we haven't been in the Super Bowl or even the past the first round of the playoffs in 25 years. <laughs> well, um, hey, you're three and two now, so you're above you're above 50, uh, 500. So you guys are doing okay. Um, hey, real quick, I want to go back to one quick thing before I forget it. Um, I have my finger pointing to this note I made, for, so I didn't remember. So I remember not to forget it. You had mentioned. You know that um, t- technology, you know, or, or uh, you know, the younger generation wanting, you know, uh, you know, being getting more yeah. you know, to be done fast, or you know, thriving on instant gratification, things like that. Which, by the way, like I suffer with that sometimes too. In some instances, where I just, you know, I want to get something done now. Um, but, but one thing that's happening a lot, and and we and I and Chad and I were having this conversation, you know, a few different times. I can't remember which episode we were on, but around technology and just the volume of technology that's being thrown at us, and the you know, and the shiny objects that can derail you, and then people will, you know, buy one piece of technology and half-ass implement it, or you you know, or you try it, you don't use it, you now you're still paying for it, you forget you're still paying for the technology, or you already paid for it, and then you're now you're trying the next thing, and say like you got a mile wide and inch deep on things, but there's a lot of technology that's being thrown at us right now. And that's certainly not going to slow down that I think I talked about like chat GPT and things like that, or just AI in general, like all these things are, have been thrown at us in a really short, you know, time frame. Um, and, and the same thing has happened, you know, in the roofing industry, whether it be estimating softwares or if it's like, you know, new CRMs or if it's just, you know, this sales tool or this, that sales tool or whatever, there's so much stuff being thrown at us from technology like, what's your take on it? Let's talk about the residential side of the business real quick, um, since that's going to be the majority of our listeners, or, or I guess, you know, commercial, but either one doesn't matter. But like, how are you guys handling technology or what's your thought about all this new technology in the space gotten thrown at us? Well, being a baby boomer, it just scares the living crap out of me. Yeah. Okay. I sit on uh, on the NRCA uh, board and a few committees and, and I'm involved with Roofing Alliance uh, as well. And when we go and we see presentations, I see what I'm being told and what I see happening is one day you're going to take your phone and you're going to go, hey, Siri, I need a new roof. Who do I call? And all of a sudden, three bids are going to come flying into your phone like a text message in the next five minutes. Now, um, by the way, I don't know if you've ever done that. And, and you say, hey, Siri, I need a ro- new, new roof. And thank God she says, I don't understand or I can't help you with that. But I believe that's going to change. My friends at Eagle View are working with the friends at Roofer and, and they're, they're coming up with programs tied to the, uh, the Google rating list. And uh, I just see, I just know what's happening. I'm not, I'm not keen enough to this industry or to the, uh, to be smart enough in the software side of it. But I know there's people working behind the scenes to make this happen. If, um, if Elon Musk can go and, and pick up the guys from Boeing and bring it back safely, um, then um, I know yeah. that somebody's sitting behind a, a computer right now figuring out how to get Siri to answer the phone on what the cost of the re-roof is. Um, so having said that, that it scares me. Um, it's also extremely exciting because I think that part of our success that we've had is that we have adopted technology in both residential and in the commercial side of our business. Um, we're not afraid of it. We have bought every software you can possibly imagine on the commercial side. And when Matt Jaynes came to work for us, he turned us on to different things that are happening on the on the um, residential side. Um, you and the Rhino team have turned us on to a bunch of things that has made us a better company. We're getting better leads. We have better quality services that are coming from our branding and our marketing. We can see it. We can taste it. We can feel it. It's affecting our our not only our top line, but our bottom line. Um, so where I'm scared to death, I'm excited about yeah. what's out there. And I can't tell you any particular one. Like I know Rilla is somebody that we use in our in our uh, uh, residential side of our business. And I just know one day that it's going to come into the commercial side. So, yeah, I mean, uh, did I answer the question? Yeah. You, so so I, I actually think that it is a good answer because I think that's how a lot of people are, are feeling. It's, it, it's also whenever you first start talking, what it makes me think about is um, – 
you, just because you're scared of it doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it because you will get left behind if you don't adopt some of this stuff. Um, and maybe not right now, Steve, but like, it's kind of like, you know, when people had to transfer from a phone book to a website, like it was scary to get a website. What the hell is that? Um, you know, you have to have these things in place because, you, you know, if you want to continue to push your brand out there, like here, here's a great example. Why I was so excited to, you know, to work with you guys having been primarily commercial was that you had good brand equity enough that I could piggyback off of it and have quick success in the residential market because of the, you know, the Cowboys and things like that. So I knew because of the tenure of the business that I could leverage that and the technology that you weren't using to be able to gain traction quickly. And that's what happened. So I felt like I knew I had a slam dunk coming into it. I think I told Oh, wait a second. That's not what you said in your proposal. That's not what your guy said about all the hard work they were going to have to do. I didn't say I hear what you're work. saying. You know, yeah. uh, but point being is like, and this is where, you know, it's great for, you know, for our, one, our, our friendship and, and to have, you know, a partnership with you is that I do have that. Like I do pay attention to the technology side of the business because I'm constantly challenged with figuring that thing out on behalf of you know, the, the industry, we'll call home services and improvements, all the above, you know, can want to listen to this podcast and rely on me to have done my due diligence on these things to understand how they are working, how they're implemented in the success or, uh, or, or not success or failure of these, you know, of these softwares, um, the, these softwares that you can use. Rilla is a perfect example. You know, I, I, uh, I have a great relationship with uh, Sebastian and that, you know, the founder of Rilla and, um, and he's a sponsor of this podcast. You can see it on here. And not um, just because he's a sponsor, but it's a great product. It's a fantastic product. Um, and a lot of big players use them. Uh, another guy that you would have, I don't know if you met him or not. He was at um, Rhino X. His name's Dave Geiger. He was an early adopter. He's a, another big brand consolidator. One of the legends in the home services trades, a uh, big, big, big player. He adopted Rilla too. So then when I show up and Matt, you know, pulls up Rilla on his phone and I'm listening to, you know, one of your sales guys calls, I was like, what in the hell? Like, this is cool. So where that made my brain go to was like, Hey, you know, we have human beings in this company listening to every single phone call, like at Rhino. How can we start to utilize like a call analysis AI tool? Well, um, you know, I went back to our sponsor and I said, guys, like we have an answering service. Like we, we should be doing the same thing, except let's try to figure out how to do it real time. Well, that comes January. So now I can be able to hear as everybody's on the call, a CSR, it's auto, it's, it's immediately transcribing out the call, recognizing the coaching points, recognizing how they like in real time. Well, that's fantastic. So, you know, it's going to have to be QA'd for a long time. So it's not like I can just get rid of, you know, answering agents. They just need to now move into more of a QA role. I'm making sure we're continuously feeding the, you know, the machine, you know, the intelligence. But to make us better and faster, you know, not to, not to replace, to make us better and faster for you. So I can make a decision in real time based on real time results and real technology is doing that for us, Steve. Like, so that's where it becomes beautiful is when you know how to implement it in a way that can, that one you can trust the numbers are correct and that you've got somebody who owned the implementation of it and you're actually using the tool uh, to its best ability for your business. That's what becomes really powerful. It's the adoption of the things you don't know that are scary. And it's like, well, man, how long is it going to take me to learn this one? And is that where your best, you know, is that where your best seat it needs to be on the bus? Maybe not, but you find the person whose best seat it is on that bus. And maybe sometimes that's a partner like me who's doing that for you. So two things out of this, first of all, um, you have to want to do this. You have to have the mindset. You have to have the culture to want to do this. There's nothing wrong with a culture that says, I'm going to do so many dollars every year. I'm going to have so many employees. And this is where I'm at. I make a comfortable living. And uh, and when in the, in the roofing side, when a storm comes through or something like that on the B2C side of the business, I'm going to have a fantastic year. And when it doesn't, I'm going to have a regular business. That's a fine business. As long as you understand that you're going to lose 20% of your business every year that you had nothing to do with. It's just going to happen to you. Then you also can do the other direction. You can be so focused on growth and and uh, and and taking over the world that you miss the blocking and tackling and building the foundation of your organization. And you miss that emotional intelligence of the employee of having the right person in the right seat. And if you don't have a foundation to work from from an operating system, whether it be a business operating system or it be uh, an operating system for how you manage your employees or, or whatever your, your system is for the software and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, you just have to decide what mindset you want to be and where you really want to take your company. I'm of the belief of the one of the best books ever written 
uh, with Stephen Covey's um, Seven uh, Habits of Highly Effective People. And I'm a big believer of beginning with the end in mind and seek to understand before being understood. Um, if you follow those two practices, they've been a, a, a just a guiding light for me in my entire the entire career. And we're not going to talk about how long that's been. But in the, uh, my entire career, following those two principal points of the seven habits have been uh, have given me a great return on investment, a great quality of life. Yeah, I, I think that um, there's probably a lot. I guarantee you there's a lot of people listening right now who are just started the business because they needed, they wanted to start a business because they were unhappy somewhere else and they are not even thinking about the end. They're just thinking about tomorrow, you know, and what I need to do tomorrow or, or just, I need another, you know, lead. I need another sale. Like they're at the basics of it right now. So it's good sage advice, you know, for, to think like, what do you want with the business? Because I do believe you, if you figure out, and if, by the way, if, the, if it's just, you know, my goal is a, a revenue goal, that's okay. Not, wasn't for me. My goal was like, um, how can I continue to be the best, most reliable source for this industry? And if I just do it every day and I, and I'm starting an HVAC, I should be the best of the best at it. Cause I'm focused on it every single day. And I was focused on being great at my job and the revenue was a byproduct of it. There came a time when I needed to set a revenue goal, but it wasn't for the sake of a top line revenue goal; it's for the sake of our giving goal. So we knew we needed to hit X revenue to hit a certain level of giving that Anna and I wanted to commit to. And we've done that and we did it for years. Then you bring on a sponsor. Well, a sponsor certainly has a sponsor being a private equity partner, for those who don't know, certainly has a revenue goal in mind, but you still get to dictate how, how you chase that revenue down and not lose your integrity, not lose your, like your, uh, you know, your reputation, which means everything to me. You know, and it's still fun in that, in that way. But whatever you do, think about whatever your end is, you know, or what you hope you want it to be. And then to Steve's point, you can work backwards from that thing to try and figure out what your plan to achieve those things with some like um, attainable goals along the way. Cause if you don't set attainable goals, you'll constantly be defeated. So, and, and, and by the way, it can change. It changes, it changes all the time. It changes as the business skills and as you skill as a human being and a, a professional. Yeah. The, I mean, it's environmental conditions that you have no control over. And then as, as the business advances, um, there will be dynamic changes in handling that. We had 11 employees that we started the company with, three of us being Keychain and Steve and eight other folks. We had worked with five of those eight other folks before in different f- phases of businesses, and the other three came from outside the uh, uh, our, our inner circle. Um, now there's a little less than 500. It's a little different on managing the first 100 to getting to 250, to getting to 500. It's different requirements. Uh, There's different government requirements in those scenarios, much less other things. And so, yeah, we build our our goals based on uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual, three-year, and and, uh, five-year goals. And we have that big audacious goal out there that's a 10-year goal. And every action that you do goes against that filter and your core value filter. I was going to ask you about BHAG and you just ruined it. That was literally my closing comment. <laughs> See, took it away from you. Now you're going to have to dance on your feet here. Come on, show me how, what, how else you can do this. <laughs> well, listen, I, I don't know how to get around at this point. I do think that, um, you know, I, the most of what I hear out of, of all this is like, kind of like trying to like recap on all these things are, I'll try to funnel this thing back to you. What's the, what's like the main skill of that human being? And I think one word that I would use to describe it would be perseverance. I think another thing that you had said was vulnerable. Like if you don't know, somebody does know, go find the person, go find the training. This is stuff that we talk about. There's just a couple of key things in here. I think that have let you three um, who started this business, continue to build this business and, and uh, it could be, yes, the, we have the same end goal in mind, but you have these characteristics that allow you to continue to plow towards those goals. And, and the EOS strategy certainly can help keep you accountable to those goals. And we implemented that you know, a few years back too. Um, I did the disc, the disc profile. I'm a high ID. Um, uh, probably doesn't no shock you. No wonder we like much. each other, right? <laughs> probably doesn't shock you too much. Two, two brothers from another mother. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So we like to have fun. We also can be a visionary. We also like to make sure we're driving this thing down the right path. 
Um, you know, just find out, you know, what your strength is, man. And you might surprise yourself just by doing one of these things. But if it's something as simple as like, you feel like you're probably wearing multiple hats and doing different things and you kind of, kind of have a goal in mind, but you don't know how to hold each other accountable. Like this traction book is a, is a piece of cake. You can get EOS traction coaches to come and help you implement these things in your business. But that might be. Which a I strongly, re- strongly recommend you have an implementer. Strongly recommend. If you try to do it yourself, you're going to miss out on it. You know, at the end of the day, you have to decide what you want to invest in. I mean, really, at the end of the day, as a business owner, are you investing in getting help to run your business? Are you investing in your employees? What kind of return on investment are you looking for? Are you building a platform, a skeleton? Is it the blueprint to build you build your foundation of where you're trying to get to in your three, five, 10 year goal? You're just trying to survive. Um, how vulnerable do you want to be? Do you really want one of your employees that you're paying you to turn around and tell you that you're an asshole? Are you are you ready for that? Because we get so close to the forest, you can't see the trees. I remember hearing that from my grandfather, and it, it, it's true. Um, you've got to be vulnerable. You've, you've got to want to build a team um, because you can't do it yourself. If you want to do it yourself, let me tell you something. Instagram, YouTube, get on there. There are plenty of talking heads that are out there on any subject that you want, and somebody's going to pay for it at five bucks a month to do it, and you get a uh, you know 10,000 people out there. You don't need any of this other stuff. You just get on there and do your thing. Me, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to build a company, have a good partnership, build a place where people could earn the compensation they need to build the life that they wanted to have, and fortunately, we did it in roofing. Yeah, and you did an exceptional job. So far, so good, man. <laughs> well, I just want to say uh, to kind of close this thing out. I feel like that was a good of it uh, from my from my BHAG, <laughs> just to put that out there. Um, but I'm grateful, man. Like I, like I said, I, I can't say it enough. And every time I'm with you, I tell you, I just I love spending time with Steve. Like I, we always have great conversation, great company, smart guy. I know if I have if I need anything, I can call you and ask you, and you'll show up, and you know, vice versa for me. Um, but listen, like he's that kind of guy. So if you're listening to this podcast too, and you end up going on LinkedIn and finding him and ask him a question, um, Steve's going to respond to you, man. Might be slow because he's, you know, sometimes he's, yeah. he's you know, 79, pushing 80 years old, but, uh, Oh, 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 not- Oh, Oh, back up that freight train. Uh, uh-uh. uh, I was just going to tell you how blessed I was to know you. Now I need to call Anna and have her put you in timeout. <laughs> I'm kidding, but he's just a gracious guy too, but just incredibly, you know, sharp. I and mean, these guys built a, fan, a fantastic, a fantastic business, a hard business, especially in that commercial industrial space. Um, but I've had a lot of great success, but man, just a great heart. I'm so grateful to, uh, you know, to want to have, to have a partner with you that you use my business means a lot to me and that we're friends. Number one, like that means the most to me. So I appreciate you giving us the time to share with all the listeners and um, man, I can't wait till I get to see you again. Me too. And, and, you know, it takes a team to build it. Uh, my partner and I, Keith, and our CFO, Jane, we had such a great group of people uh, to, to build from. And um, here we are 21 years later celebrating uh, a great run. And uh, we've built a company for sustainability. And now we're going through succession. So we'll see how it all works out. Yeah, congratulations. That's going to be exciting. I'm excited to watch the whole thing. So, um, well, I'll just say I'll finish with this. You know. Um, to our listeners, you know, you'll have there lots of ideas in here. Again, this is just from Steve's perspective and how Steve and his partners have built their business. But some of this stuff is sage advice that has worked, you know, decade after decade in different types of businesses, which is why I said in the beginning, this podcast is industry agnostic. It's just the tools, the tools of building business. It's again, you're in a relationship game. Some of the stuff is just figuring out how do you show up? Like, and where can you maybe work on yourself or how do you you speak with your, how do you talk to your team? Do you need to change that? Do a disc profile, um, do a color code, whatever works for you to maybe that, maybe that's what you focus on. You talked about blocking and tackling. Maybe it's just the blocking and tackling, making sure you're focusing on the basics, not getting too far ahead of your skis as a, uh, Steve little comment, uh, Steve's little comment shares with me in a comment. Um, some of it might don't, be, don't hesitate to ask for help. Yes. Don't you, hesitate. Be, be vulnerable enough to ask for help. You know, everybody, everybody in this podcast heard me say that a million times because I'm such a big believer in it. Cause I too was a guy who didn't want to ask for help until I realized I'm going to start asking for help. Cause I got my stuff done faster and I made less mistakes because of it. It cost me far less money <laughs> to, to just start asking people who knew and let go of my pride to get it done. <laughs> Bingo. 
So I appreciate you giving us your time, Steve. And to all of our listeners, again, you don't have to do everything, but you got to do something. No zero days.